After four years, doing really well, was smashing all my targets, was bypassed for a promotion. He actually said to me, stop talking to me about turnover, Holly, talk to me about profit, because you haven't got a business if it's not profitable. <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to my podcast, Taking Care of Business. My name's Paul Cheatham and today I'm delighted to have with me female entrepreneur, founder of Make Events and board member of the Manchester PA Network, Holly Moore. Hello, how, how are, are you? you? I'm, I'm good. good, how are you? <laughs> Very good, thank <laughs> good. you for coming. Thank you. So today I'm going to chat to you a little bit about the PA Network, yeah. find out a little bit more about that. Of course we want to know about how you've grown Make Events because it's... Um, Five or six years old. Six and a half years old now. And um, it's it's been going really well. It's re- growth, but challenging. So we're yes. going to find out about some of those. And then I want to find out also a little bit more about you as a person and what yeah. makes you tick. So that's how we that's how it's going to be structured, I guess. Okay. So to kick it off, then Manchester PA Network. Let's talk about yes. that. Uh, what is it? When did you get involved? Yeah. So um, have you got a PA? No. No. Okay. So PAs in Manchester. Um, about seven years ago, we'd be talking to each other on the phone, trying to get appointments for each other's bosses, um, and they'd be talking all morning via email and phone, and then they would probably stand next to each other in Starbucks and not realise that that's the PA that I've been talking to all morning, trying to get my boss to meet with their boss. So two PAs, um, Amanda Hargreaves and Melanie Sheehy, decided to found the Manchester PA Network so that PAs could network and exchange information face to face. Um, but they set it up slightly differently in that they decided that all the ticket um, money from these networking events would go direct to the Christie. So this was seven years ago. So when I first set up my business make events, which we'll talk about later, um, they approached me to help support them on some of their events. Um, and that relationship evolved and then um, in 2013 they asked me to become a board member with them. So we bring like-minded EAs, PAs together um, at really interesting networking events and in the process we've raised um, £120,000 for the Christie which is our local cancer charity You hospital. continue to do that every year for yes. the Christie? That's yeah, right. okay. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, and you have events, you have a big event coming up I believe. So. Yeah, so we do um, a calendar of events throughout the year which will be a mix of educational, showcasing venues around Manchester, um, you know, with suppliers that PAs might find interesting. Um, but this year we're running the Manchester PA Awards um, and that is going to be hosted by Geffen Jones, who you might okay. know off the TV. Yeah. And um, we've got 720 guests coming, so completely sold out with a waiting list. Um, and it will recognise um, many of the achievements of Manchester's PAs. But um, not only that, um, it will raise money for obviously the Christie on the night as well. And it's, I think, one of the only non-for-profit um, awards that's run in Manchester. Okay. We don't make any money off it at all. Um, it's in November? November the 1st at the Lancashire Cricket Ground. Very good. 700? 700. 720. PAs and PAs. Yes, with their bosses as well. Brilliant. Yes. Very good. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's talk about make events. Yeah. You set it up six and a half years ago, you've just said. You was at AstraZeneca in yes. the events team. I guess take you from there. Yeah, okay. So I'd worked in hospitality and events, um, you know, since I was 20, and um, the latter part of my career at AstraZeneca, for those of you that don't know, is the big pharmaceutical company in Cheshire. And AstraZeneca were way ahead of their time before Google had slides or anything like that. And they had a business within the business, which was all about employee engagement. And part of that employee engagement to recruit, motivate and retain was an event strategy. And um, so they used to put on, um, you know, themed fun days, balls, um, any kind of event that as an employee you would be able to go to and other events that you could bring your family to as well to kind of thank your family supporting you through your career. So I got really passionate about events as part of a strategy. So rather than it just putting on a party, um, events that had a meaning and an ROI, I guess. So I was there four years and um, we'll go on a little bit into sort of my personal journey later on. Um, But after four years, doing really well, was smashing all my targets, was bypassed for a promotion and um, being a loyal employee, been there four years, my previous company nine years before, I decided to leave without a job to go to. 
So uh, I guess the story is I wasn't on a significant wage, so I didn't have those golden handcuffs. Um, but what it opened up to me is that um, I, I just sort of thought, you know what, rather than be treated in a way that I didn't think was fair, yeah. I'd rather go and make my own way and do some freelancing in the events arena um, rather than stay in a job I was unhappy in. So that was the progression from, you know, employment. full-time employment, yeah. yeah, yeah, to that scary world. In that year where I freelanced, I had no real drive at the start to set up a business. It was more like, I want to get out of this situation and this is a situation I can jump into really, really quickly. But as I worked in the events market, and when I was at AstraZeneca, I was very much um, very green. I wasn't involved in the Manchester business scene. I was just in a big corporate company. Um, so when I kind of leaped into the Manchester business scene, um, you know, I didn't know who a lot of the big players were or anything like that. And as I did more and more events, I began to see a little bit of a niche in the market. And that's what initially prompted setting up Make Events. Okay. Um, you st- the funding you didn't you, you did it all naturally by yes, yourself. Yeah. Yes. So we. So what happened was I'd seen this niche in the market, which I felt was I was admiring and looking at all these events online, but I could tell which event company had done which event. Okay. So I thought, is there a bit of a niche for an events company that does an event that's very much about the customer and the brand? So you look at it and you know it's a Sajulo event, or rather than it's a make events event. And then there was also a kind of feeling within a female uh, entrepreneurial person, particularly in the events industry, that you needed to be a ball breaker or a bitch or, you know, you're not tough enough to do this, Holly. And that was kind of what I was being told. And I just thought, do you know what? What if I can be nice and also yeah. run a business? Yeah. So those were my two, I guess, drivers setting up, you know, really bespoke events and also kind of wanting to prove something yeah. really that you yeah. could be nice and be yeah. successful. Um, so that was kind of the initial driver for setting up Make Events. Okay. And did you do a business plan? Did you... Some people do, some people don't. We've never had one here. <laughs> some people are driven by them. Yeah. What about you? Well, actually, so back to your question um, that, that, that you said about funding. So I decided I was going to start off. I came up with the name, which is as simple as it is with Make Events. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my logo and everything. And in my head, I thought, right, I'm going to need about five grand to set up. So I thought I could probably scrape that together with credit cards and, you know, etc. But what actually happened was I got two clients, two great clients in the first week, which was people I knew, so Late Rooms and Macau Health. And because they decided to go with me straight away, I was able to invoice the deposit straight away, which meant that we had cash in the bank. And literally from that day in July 2012, we've generated cash, we've bootstrapped the whole business ourselves. We haven't got an overdraft, we haven't got a credit card, and we've been profitable every single year, and I've been able to take a salary. You're one of the few um, clients, we have all different types of clients, as you know, but it's very unusual for a client to have the growth you've had Mm-hmm. And the profitability, you've, but you've always been quite. You've always maintained a certain profit percentage, yeah. haven't you? In yeah. your head, does that just give make you sleep at night? Or yeah. Why? Why is that? Oh gosh, I think I'm. I mean, I'm a bit old-fashioned, aren't I? You know, could imagine me like sat at home with an abacus counting everything. But I think from the beginning, I think because I'm a, I'm not a borrower anyway, personally. For me to feel secure, I always, always needed to have cash in the bank and would always get payment up front for events, which meant we could play, play our suppliers on time because sure. we wanted to treat suppliers in the same way we would treat a client and have yeah. that really good relationship. So we were, I guess, cash flow was was good for us. Making sensible decisions, so not blowing loads of money on you know crazy marketing schemes and things like that. So I very I can still tell you now what's in every single bank account. Yeah. I mean I don't know how long yeah. that'll last, but somebody said to me and once actually, and um, Wayne Taylor, who's got a great business, Space Zero in Manchester, he actually said to me, Stop talking to me about turnover, Holly, talk to me about profit because you haven't got a business if it's not profitable. Yeah. And rightly or wrongly, um, that really stuck with me and it made me very focused on bottom line. Yeah. And um so what I did over the last few years as well is retained you know, most of the profits in the businesses yeah. we've got along. Um, and that's made, it, like you said, it makes me sleep at night. It yeah. makes me feel, if the business isn't profitable, sometimes I question. I would, I would question it in my yeah. head. So, yeah. And, and me and you've been working together, so sometimes I'm yeah. questioning you why you need to have so much yeah. profit. But I think we'll talk about that in a little bit later. Yes. We'll talk about where you are today. Yes. Because 
because actually you've made a decision to reinvest some of that profit yes. to create a better a better lifestyle, I guess, or a better balance. But we'll talk about that a bit later on. Yeah. You said you signed your first two clients, um, great clients, late yeah. rooms and McCann. Yes. And then you signed a third client, yeah. uh, which you spoke about before. Yeah. We'll t- talk about that one. So that was Betfred, the owner of Betfred, Fred Doan. Um, and I think that came about just building relationships. So year one of our business was based 52% was venue referral. So I'll always be thankful to all the hotels and venues in Manchester who kind of took me into their heart. You know, I turned up with a track record in events, but but for other people. And uh, I had a coffee with some girls at the Lowry Hotel. And um, I just said to them, look, you know, if you're looking, if somebody's got a smaller budget and they're looking for something, you know, here's my card. And um, literally within a week, um, Fred Doan and his family and Fred was, you know, for those of you that do or don't know, he's one of the top um, richest in the northwest with some fantastic businesses and just by chance came in to talk about an event. They gave this little business card that I think I'd had printed off Vista and I got a call from him and he loves a grafter and for whatever reason I think he saw something in me that was like this girl's not going to let me down yeah. and when he gave me the job he just phoned me and he said Holly keep everything confidential don't let me down and six and a half years later you know touch wood yeah. um, I've not let him down and he remains a client yeah you still work with him don't you yeah 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 you, you mentioned in there just then uh, the venue referral. Yes. So that's a part of the business when I looked in from the outside at your yeah. business. I didn't know you. Yeah. You did. So yeah. you just want to go into that a little bit. Uh, yeah. More. So when we started off, um, obviously it was a smaller business, and I talked to you know there might be a client would would be organising a conference or a party or an awards at a venue, and they might say to the venue organisers, "Oh, do you have anyone you could recommend?" So they would ring us, and we would go and meet the client, and. Um, obviously hopefully help the client with their whatever it was they needed so it has been really important to us to to build those relationships what pains me a bit now is we're so busy because we've got so much bigger that I feel like sometimes I don't have the time that I used to have to invest with all the amazing event coordinators at every event you know in all the venues that supported me right from the beginning and that sometimes you know, it upsets me a bit because yeah. I would love to have that time, but I don't as much anymore. But it is part of your plans, though, to grow that part yeah. of the business again, isn't it? Yeah, so like on the flip side of that, then about three years ago, we set up a business within Make Events, and we'll talk more about what Make Events does. But we set up a separate department, which is our venue finding department, which is just such a great business because clients would come to us looking for meeting room space or event space and we go out and find all the venues for them which is a free service so um yeah so we are working with the venues really really closely and referring venues across the uk and uh you know overseas so the first few years then you're storing cash you're making profits and uh, you've got some great clients to kick you off and um, you start bringing on some employees i guess who 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 were your first two? Are they still there? First, Sue. So okay. Sue always has to have a mention. So Sue and I worked together 20 years ago on reception, um, and I was her boss on reception. And she always said to me when she left that job, if you ever do anything on your own, will you keep me in mind? And when I set up Make Events in the July and decided by the February I wanted a permanent employee, and I always wanted a permanent employee, not just someone that you know come in and I'll pay you. Yeah. You know, whatever just to work for me I wanted somebody on board I think at that point in my life it was really important to have somebody that I trusted because I was working all the hours God sent I was totally stressed and overwhelmed which involved a lot of tears and I was working from home as well so it was really important to have somebody that I trusted sure. and I think the really nice journey Sue's had with us six and a half years later is she says she had a third baby just to get away from me for a year <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, she's been part time as our office manager and now um, that role has grown into full time, but rather than Sue have to leave the business, we've shaped our role. And as you know, she's becoming our yeah. part time finance assistant. Yeah. And that's what we want to do. We want to support people in their personal journeys as well as that's them. Yeah. So Sue was the first, yeah. and then you got up to about five. And yeah. you were turning over a lot of money when you was at five, but yeah. that's kind of the nature also your industry to a yeah. degree because you have a lot of freelancers, yes. don't you? Yes. But So you built up over a period to five what were they events coordinators or yes yeah, so in the very beginning I, I think really because I was been mindful of budget I took on people that didn't have experience but I had like I could feel they had the make events vibe it's hard to put that into words so 
So um, yeah, we, we had a, a two ladies, Abby and Claire, who will, they don't work for us permanently anymore, but freelance on events yeah, for us yeah. all this time later. Um, and then slowly, I think our fourth, our fourth and fifth employees were from the events industry. And that was when you really started to kind of add value in terms of they had quite a lot of knowledge to bring to the party about the industry and that started to step things up. Okay. Latterly, we'll bring it kind of up to date. You've changed tact as we just mentioned earlier. Um, because as, it's a great thing to keep storing profit and, yeah. and the cash balance is growing all the time. But I think it's fair to say you got to a position maybe about 12 months ago, just, just a little yeah. bit short, where, if you don't mind me saying, you're turning over a few million quid, you're not, you've got five staff, yeah. and you're turning over a few million quid. I was a bit stressed. <laughs> yeah, and you were a bit stressed, because it, it was kind of, the, the whole business revolved around you. Yeah. And you've got Hollymore events, we'll talk about that separately yes. again in a second. But you did, you made a decision to change, I guess, or reinvest. Yes and go to the next level. Yeah. So yeah, talk to about that. How did you reach that conclusion, I guess? Yeah, so I'd say even going back a little bit further, two years ago, um, we realised we'd done our own marketing, our own logo, our own positioning, and we just realised that we were doing some really nice business with some great corporate clients, but our messaging wasn't, I guess, reflecting what we were delivering. So we made, in terms of like investing back, we decided to go to a marketing agency to carry out um, you know, a project, to re not change the name, but reposition us. And that was really eye-opening for any small businesses out there. You know, I would say there's probably an investment of 20, 30 grand to, to, to reposition, but it was the most valuable thing that we did um, because it was a, an experienced third party going out to market, speaking to our clients, our customer, sorry, our clients, our employees, our suppliers, lost customers, and then that really transformed the business, repositioned us as a group. What was the feedback? Oh, well, um, so at work we call it the dark times, um, because some of it wasn't what we wanted to hear, to be honest, because we'd been very insular focused and very looking after each other, so we'd stay late at work to help each other out, but were we staying out, were we staying late at work to help the client? Not always. So some of the feedback was around, and I, and I hate saying it, but it was around me, if Holly wasn't on the account, yeah. We, we might not. But that's work. normal when it's you yeah, and you've got yeah. six staff, so. Yeah, and it was just hard for the team to hear, I think. But in fairness to the team, they grabbed it and thought, we're going to run with this and got excited about it. And again, because we'd invested in using an external agency, yeah. it wasn't just me hyping out stuff to them. You know, we had an expert talking to them. So we really worked on that change management piece, how we would work with a company, I guess. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm really happy to say that the transformation has been amazing and um, we, we actually revisited all the questions with the colleagues and the clients really recently and the difference, the shift in perception to the client and the way that the, our colleagues feel about the business is, is just huge. Yeah. So the structure now has gone from five to almost 20. Yes. You're creating a management team. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the structure then and, and what you're doing and, and as you say, You've then since gone out and kind of measured whether that's been yeah. successful. Yeah. Because ultimately your clients are going to tell you that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think, Paul, like, for those of you that maybe don't know as much about Sedulo, like, you advise entrepreneurs on their business. So I think we got to a point, you actually asked the question, which I didn't answer, did I have a business plan? No. <laughs> I would just go, oh, that's yeah. what we want yeah. to turn over this year. So I think going back 12 months, again, I do believe in investing in experts to grow your business. So I came to you and I said, I want to formulate a proper business strategy and plan. I'm going to go out to three people, no offense. Yeah. I'd like you to be one of them, but I'm going to yeah. go out to market and look for somebody to do this properly. Oh, I'll ask you the other two were. <laughs> well, they weren't as good as you, you wanted to hear. <laughs> so we, we obviously chose to work with you, and I think because you were already our accountants, that was the kind of thing, well, you know the P&L, the balance sheet inside out. So. So we sat down, didn't we, and put together um, a business plan and strategy. And, um, you know, you sat there, maybe used a few swear words, and said, um, you know, you've got all these headaches, and you had these headaches six months ago, and if you want to get rid of these headaches, this is what we need to do. And the headaches were, I needed to delegate for yeah. more lead leadership, really. So we, again, used 
an expert went out to Forge Roll, which is a Manchester-based recruitment company, and we went to market for a client services director who would manage the team sure. and that account, overall account management piece for our current clients, and then a commercial director that would manage new business, sales, marketing. Um, and they came in April and May of this year, and people were saying to me, oh God, how are you going to find it delegating? And I was like, I am so ready to delegate. Sure. Um, so that has been... I mean, we're, we're like a different business. Yeah. And then, you know, they've now recruited new people exactly. to the business. Yeah. And it's trusting them. You know, in fairness, like, they've, you know, they've thrown some wild cards at me when we've had CVs. And I've had to trust them. And so far, what I'm seeing is they are making the right decisions, which is brilliant. But the feedbacks, I've seen the feedback yeah. from your clients were everybody gets, everybody gets Holly Moore, really, even though it's not through Holly Moore. Yeah. Yeah. So you haven't lost that through the brand, have you? No, what's really interesting is, I was actually interviewed uh, with EY for an entrepreneur award, which I didn't win, um, but a while ago, and they said to me, well, how can you scale, because it's not all about you. Because I guess they met me and could see my passion and enthusiasm. I said, what you don't realize is, 50% of the clients I've never met. You know, their person is Heather or um, Faye, or that's, you know, that's who their person is. But what's been really interesting, the last few months, suppliers have actually been coming to me and taking time out to say, your team, you can tell that they've spent time with you because they're empowered to make decisions. They're not running back to you for answers. But I know as a supplier, that's the decision you would make. And that was like music to my ears. Of course, yeah. And we did, um, I know we'll talk more about the kind of events we do, but um, we did... Um, Virgin East Coast, which is now LNER's Employee Engagement Awards last week. And I'm notorious for turning up on an event when the team have set up and saying, change that, change that, change that. And I got on site on Thursday, and this is a huge event, and there was absolutely nothing I'd changed. And I was so proud of the team because it was it was make events. Yeah. So you've built a structure. Yeah. Um, so let's let's tell us where make events is today. You've got a teams in, team in place now, and you're still growing yes. as a business. Talk to us again about some of your clients you're working with at the moment. Yeah. So Make Events, um, we do creative events that drive engagement, and whether that's employee engagement or customer engagement. So under that umbrella would be award ceremonies, conferences, parties, launch parties, brand activations, team building, and then of course the venue sourcing side, which I mentioned before. Yeah. So um, some of the clients that we're working with that people would know would be um, Puma, um, Virgin, Kellogg's, uh, The Hook Group. Um, still um, Betfred. Betfred, still um, McCann. Um, and I think I'm very passionate within the wellness sector. So uh, I'm loving the fact that we're stepping into that arena a little bit more. We've worked with Beauty Bay, which is a local yeah. um, business, look fantastic. So, yeah. And if you took a snapshot of today or this week yeah. or this month, tell us the events you're working on now Gosh, we've that you're allowed to say. So we've had a busy month. So, so as mentioned, we did Employee Engagement Awards for Ellen the Art, formerly Virgin East Coast. We've done a 15th anniversary for a local Manchester finance company. We did a brand activation for an online beauty brand, which was bringing a lot of social media influencers into one space and having all the products that they sell um, in a brand activation event. We have done a early Christmas party, which is a themed event for a company that doesn't like to have their Christmas party in December. Okay. Oh gosh, what else? Have so that would be a snapshot, yeah. yeah. And then on the other side, you have your corporate side yes. and you have your personal party yeah. side, yeah. Polymore events, yes. so talk to us a bit more about that. Yeah, so what we found was that um, the more that we've delivered um, really fantastic creative corporate events, then like the managing director or the CEO would be approaching me saying, I've just built a house, can I have a house warming? It's my 50th birthday, could you do that? So we felt that, that, that it would be good to have a separate business for that because it has to be, it's a, it's a different way of pricing and it's a different service. So we set up Polymore Events. We can only take on six events per year. But to give you an example, so we did your wedding yeah. earlier this year. I made the cut. Yeah. <laughs> you six. did. You did, yeah. You got <laughs> in the diary. Um, we've done um, a 75th birthday. We're doing um, a wedding in France at the moment. We're doing a housewarming in Hale. But I just I can only do six because 
I would hate for anybody not to get that first class service. So mm. that's all that we can commit to. On you actually time. really enjoy that side, though, don't you? Oh yeah, I do because it's so like personal. And um, I remember one wedding we did years ago, and I was sort of stood in the um, entrance to the church with the bride and the father, and I just thought that moment will be on her memory for absolutely. You know, I was straightening a veil yeah. and help spritzing a perfume, and it's those little things like that that you become a part of somebody's like history I yeah. guess and I do really like that side yeah what else that drives you what else drives you you're very you're six and a half years in and you've not lost any passion I yeah. think that's for sure what is it what what um what drove you to own your own business and then how's that changed yeah so shall I touch on like the mental health side just because that we'll come on to that in a second but uh, more about what's driving you at the moment, at the moment. What, yeah what keeps your excitement levels up I know you've started to do some public speaking, yeah. so you're uh, yeah. moving, but yeah, what is it that drives you to keep going to that next level? Because you could stop now, no yeah. one stop, stop. Yeah. I mean, you could take, a, you built an infrastructure, you could let that ride, yeah. you could still take, have a nice lifestyle, yeah. and relatively stress-free, but you're going again now, building yeah. to get to the next level. Yeah. So what's driving you to do that? There's so many things that drive me, I hope I managed to cover them all. So I'd say one is, um, we're at the stage now, which has taken six and a half years, where people are coming to us. So you know what it's like in the beginning. It's all about the the overused word, the hustle. Uh, but you know, you're you know you and we still do that. We're still selling. We're still doing yep. sales and marketing. We're still doing social media. But we're getting those phone calls now where somebody's like, "I've heard of you. I really want you to do my event." So that's massively motivating because you feel like you've got a brand that people are interested in. So that motivates me. I think seeing the team members particularly that I've had with me a good few years and the event that I mentioned where I didn't have to touch anything, that um, Heather's been with me, you know, three and a half, four years and to see that development is is so motivating. Sure. Um, what else motivates me? I'm so passionate about training your brain and uh, setting goals and I'm very visual and I'm so passionate about setting timed goals and writing them down and I get a kick I think off ticking them off so that motivates me I think difficult challenges motivate me yeah. I think when I get thrown something really difficult and then I turn it around and make it into something positive I get quite a kick out of that yeah um, it's really important for you to develop your brand isn't it yeah. you really want make events to be known yeah and I think that is a big motivator there's that yeah. brand of make events and then there's also just to touch on the public speaking side you start to do a lot more of that What's yeah. the driver behind that? Yeah, so I think when I was at AstraZeneca, I remember my boss stood um, doing a fashion show for like 500 people. And I remember looking at her and thinking, I could never do that, I could never do that. And then they put us on some training on mm. doing it and um, I really enjoyed it. And I am a massive believer on, I've read the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And it's all about, you know, fears like this barrier in front of you and you can push through the other side. So I thought, right, that could be a really good challenge for me. And that was years and years ago. And then as Make Events developed, people like Manchester University would contact me and say, could you come and speak to students about this topic? And that was quite a nice audience for me because they're younger. So, you know, yeah. so I did that and that I did that on how to get a job in the events industry. And then Inside the Northwest approached me and said, would it be on a panel? On? And then the more I did it, the more I got really good feedback. And I guess I'm, I am a creative at heart and for me um, I think standing on a stage with a presentation and talking and being animated is quite a buzz and I think I'm a massive believer and I've read a lot on storytelling because it's something that I want to get better and better at over the years that you should never tell a story unless you've dealt with it and also only share what you're comfortable with yeah. I guess going all over the internet yeah. so yeah I think I think on that's that. what drives yeah, me. On that then, we can talk about mental illness. Yes. Um, you know that I um, talk a lot about anxiety, yeah. that's my issue, and I have to deal with that yeah. every day. Mine came after um, launching a business. Um, if we talk about yours, yours was pre your yeah. business. Tell us what, whatever, like you said, tell us within your... Tell, me the, tell you the bit I yeah. want to tell you. Yeah, yeah so I um, have only literally started talking about this in January this year. For a few reasons, I didn't feel 100% confident in talk, feeling like it was, it didn't feel 100% the right time, I guess that's the only way I could put it. And then I told the story first in January and was quite emotional about it, but again, got a great feedback and response. So my story was that 
um, I had a quite a specific mental health issue for five years in my kind of late 20s to early 30s and um, spent a five year journey trying to get well to no avail read so much about it and it said you know it's, it's something you have to live with like you were saying yeah. and I was very had a you know I got the right treatment I got some really pioneering treatment via the Priory right at the end and I put my heart and soul into it because it was it was this is either going to work or my life is basically okay. going to be you know and I put everything into it and I'm really proud to say that seven and a half years later I'm completely free of it and on absolutely no medication so that was like five I always say it's like I lost five years of my life and you know did I would, it consume you that much oh god yeah and I would say the only way I can describe it is like a functioning alcoholic I was a functioning so on the surface I wasn't alcoholic by the way yeah, what yeah. I mean was I was had a mental health problem in the background that nobody could see and I would go to work every day and I would go out with my friends but I was dealing with all this you know my close family knew about it and were massively supportive yeah. but I just kind of thought oh is this it this is what I've got to live with for the rest of my life and yeah. um, now when I got well and the blinkers came off if you like when I look back on my life even to being a little girl there's was a strain of it okay. and actually um, you know, you and I have sat on a panel talking mm. about um, you know looking um, out for signs of poor mental health with children I feel like I can probably spot little things sometimes because when I look back on my own life yeah. Um, and uh, yeah so I got well a year before starting the business and then I think because like I say the blinkers came off and because I'd suddenly what, why I touched on before I'm so passionate about training the brain I shifted my thinking so much. I, I cannot even tell you. I was such a worrier before. I constant, constant, constant. And I trained my brain not to operate in that way. I think I rewired my brain like genuinely. I think Ruby Wax says something about that in some of her talks about mental health. And so then that opened up to the door. Well, well if I can train my brain to not do that anymore, what can I train yeah. my brain to do? Yeah. So that, when you go back to the drivers and what drives me, when you've been through something like that and you can literally transform your life through you through looking after your mental health it makes you it makes you fearless and it makes you really believe you can achieve a lot yeah. more than i can yeah if you if there was one piece of advice you could give to somebody what would it be that was suffering with yeah. mental health yeah it's really hard because i was very very lucky in that i phoned a doctor who got it and but I know so many stories of people that phone the doctor and they don't get it. Yeah. Um, practical advice that I could give people is yes, obviously talk and phone the doctor. It's so much more well recognised than it was when I was poorly. So the help is out there and it is understood. And I know that not everybody could be able to do this, but it is worth putting a bit of money at. So for example, you know, um, the Priory are amazing and um, or look if your company provides private health care, um, talk to people that you can trust. Is it massively expensive? Well, yeah, I, so I think the treat, mm. I think a, tr a 45 minute session at the Priory is about £130. Yeah. But what the Priory do do, which is brilliant, is that let's say you were going to go through the NHS channels, but you'll present yourself to a doctor and it is a three month waiting list unless you suicidal oh. um, to get help. What the Priory will do is if you get referred by the doctors, this is just really good private but practical advice. Um, you go you can actually get your medication prescribed by the priory so it's very specific to what you're suffering with whereas the doctor it might be a little bit more general sure so that's one small financial investment that you could do yeah to help yourself even if you went back through the nhs okay. practice work-life balance how do you find that now i mean because i have to work on it a lot yeah for my yeah. for anxiety yeah um, yours isn't really for that, is it? Because yours is gone now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but still, we all need a work-life balance. So how yeah. do you how do you get yours? I mean, I didn't in the beginning. The first three years was just ridiculous. Um, I do now. Um, so I absolutely will go to the gym every single morning early, and that is my time for me. It's the time that I'm not Holly who owns a business. I'm just Holly that turns up no makeup and mess yeah. around the gym for now. So I really love that. And I am quite, I used to work every weekend, you know, to catch up on stuff. I'm a bit more strict now, so I do like to see my friends or family, you know, in the evenings. 
but I'll carve out maybe two half days, Saturday, Sunday, to do some thinking work. But I love it, so it's yeah. not like, oh, God, it's difficult got to do to... this. Yeah, I really enjoy it, yeah. Uh, having said that, I used to think it was a real strength of mine in my 20s that I could work all weekend. Yeah. And I would, and I think yeah. that was a real positive. And yeah. now if I would do that, yeah. I would see if there was a real negative. Yeah. You know, so it was kind of, I've, I've moved in my mind what's, what's actually the right thing, what's the positive thing. You go through stages, do. don't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it probably wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily, if you said to you six and a half years on, oh, I'm working 18 hour days, seven days a week, well, you maybe you're doing something wrong then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Agreed, yeah. agreed. Well, we're coming towards the end now. Yes. But some quick fire questions. Favourite part of the job? Well, I haven't got one favourite. I've got a lot. So, I, I sorry. I uh, love the team development. absolutely love that. It, creating creative events that have literally come from a thought in your head and you do visualise everything and then being on site and seeing it come together and the client loving it, there's no better feeling. Um, yeah, team and events, client events. Favourite event you've done? So, favourite corporate event would probably be for a well-known food brand when we coordinated an overseas conference in Dubai for them. So they had a conference at a venue and then we whisked them all away pretending that they were going on a, a, like a sightseeing tour on a boat and we actually took them to a private island and they had a whole other event on a private island. Nice, that was nice. really good in Dubai. And favourite private event would be um, a private birthday party. It was a 70th birthday party and um, it was um, called Magic Moments and we had Ronan Keating which would have been good enough in itself but we also had Kylie Minogue as well. Ah, well I was just about to say who's the favourite artist you've worked with? Kylie Minogue! <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. <laughs> um, current entrepreneurs that you admire? Yeah so I mean I I love lots of people lots of local people but I guess my guru um, would be Tony Robbins. Um, do you listen to much of I don't, but you've just come back from his conference yes, at Black Camp, yeah. and you're booked to go next year, so yes. it must be good, but tell us a little bit about that. Then. So he's an American motivational speaker, and he's Marmite. Some people love him, and some people really don't like him at all. I've got so much from him. So right back from the beginning of Make Events, again, when we talk about investing in things that are going to grow your business, I bought all his CDs, which were like hundreds of pounds. I listen to them again and again, and you have workbooks, and write everything down. So I took the bullet this year and went to Unleash the Power Within, which is a four day seminar from like eight in the morning till midnight at the XL London with 13,000 people. And it was absolutely- Four amazing. days? Yeah, it's intense. Yeah. And um, you work through all these goal settings and you know all your barriers to growth. And it's absolutely amazing. And I'm, I mean, then what they tell you to do is book for next year straight away, which I did which is obviously a great sales tool, but sure. also what it means is you want to go back with better scores in all areas of your life the next year, so it drives you forward. So, yeah, which goes back to what drives me is taking off goals. Yeah. Okay, so the, the final question then is the future. What, what have you got planned? What does success look like for you in the next couple of years? Yeah, so I, with Make Events, this has been very much an infrastructure year as we touched upon, reinvesting some of the profit back to build the team ready for growth. Um, I feel like by ne the end of next year, we're becoming, obviously working with, with your team, much more results focused and target focused next year. And then I feel like the next year is when we'll start to build our satellite site. So going out to the major city, other major cities, Leeds, London, Birmingham, and having a presence in those cities. We're delivering events in those cities now, but I would like person that works for make events in those cities so that's make events yeah holly moore events from a purely um self-indulgent point of view i would love that you know the ceos and mds of manchester when they've got a special occasion coming up um would think to contact me to do their event i'm sure you will with your yeah. future yeah. events yeah. um and um yeah doing stuff like this like the podcast and um, you've recently had us on a panel which I think is on your YouTube channel, channel yeah. isn't it at the moment um, doing all things like this is really interesting because it's another string yeah. to my bow I guess so yeah very good well thank you for coming in today thank you for having me no problem so that's the end of this uh, episode episode two um, click in the link below and you can follow it follow our usual social channels you'll find um, the subscription link there for YouTube and it will also be available in podcast. 
Uh, next week, episode three, will be me sat with Daniel Gillings, who is the co-founder, actor, and, and co-founder of uh, the charity Once Upon a Smile. Thanks for listening. <laughs>